We power hope. We power dreams. We power life. For there's one power we all have. The power to make a difference. The power to vote. Energy. The power of people. Good evening and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. And I'm Craig Freeman. Tonight, we're pleased to take our production on the road, broadcasting from Central School Arts and Humanities Center in Lake Charles. We thank the mayor's office and the Central School for their hospitality. And we welcome our studio audience and everyone at home. Well, in the early morning hours of Saturday, September 24th, Hurricane Rita made landfall in southwest Louisiana bringing with it a 15 to 20 foot storm surge and essentially destroying the communities of Holly Beach, Hackberry, and Cameron. While the recovery from Hurricane Rita still continues in parishes such as Cameron, Calcasieu, Vermilion, and Jefferson Davis, Hurricane Katrina rebuilding efforts continue to get the most of national attention. And it's not just the broadcast media. A recent Google search for Hurricane Rita generated 17 million hits, while the same search for Hurricane Katrina produced 10 times as many results. Well, with this focus on Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath overshadowed the losses that Southwest Louisiana and its residents have endured from Rita, is Hurricane Rita in danger of becoming the forgotten storm? Nature's wrath is no stranger to Southwest Louisiana. Hurricane Audrey left hundreds dead in 1957. It was a storm all others would be compared to in this part of the state for half a century, until Rita. Early on the morning of September 24th last year, Category 3 Hurricane Rita came ashore near the Texas-Louisiana border. The location of landfall put low-lying Cameron Parish in the storm's right front quadrant, the zone of maximum destruction. Winds of 125 miles an hour and a wall of water two stories high swept over the mostly deserted coastal marshes. Large-scale evacuations kept the death toll down to six, but what couldn't be moved out of Rita's way was obliterated. The communities of Hackberry, Cameron, Creole, Grand Chenier, and Holly Beach were heavily damaged or destroyed. Over 4,400 structures in the parish were demolished, including four schools and a hospital. Cameron Parish Sheriff Theus Duhon experienced the devastation firsthand. Lower Cameron Parish was hit real hard by Rita. We have 86 miles of Highway 82 that runs east and west mm -hmm. along the coast, and Everything along that uh, particular highway has been destroyed. In Vermilion Parish, over 65% of agricultural and pasture land was contaminated with salt water from the storm surge. Further inland, in Calcasieu Parish, Rita damaged or destroyed nearly two-thirds of the housing stock. Sustained high winds decimated half of the tree canopy in the parish. In the worst disaster ever to hit southwest Louisiana, the actions of local officials and first responders won the praise of many, including area congressman Charles Bustani. They, they got the evacuation done in a very timely fashion. There were no deaths. This is just a tremendous accomplishment because not only were they evacuating those communities, they were housing additional evacuees from Katrina. Many local residents pride themselves on their self-reliance. In the aftermath of Rita, it was a good trait to have. FEMA, already stretched thin because of Hurricane Katrina, came under fire again and again following Rita. I, I may be the most frustrated person in the state with regard to FEMA, the way things have been going. We've fielded thousands and thousands of phone calls trying to help people with FEMA issues. And I'll tell you, my frustration with FEMA is this. The whole issue of preparedness was just basically neglected. Rita damaged 20% of all businesses in Lake Charles, but the city's mayor, Randy Roach, is just as concerned about the storm's regional impact, especially on planned construction of liquefied natural gas, or LNG, plants. We lost Cameron Parish. We lost a vital part of southwest Louisiana. We lost an area that, was, that is proposed to be home to two LNG facilities. Those LNG facilities are still going forward. They're still going to represent an investment of over $1.5 billion into this, into this region. But now the question remains, how do we service that investment? How do we build that investment? Uh, and how do we provide this infrastructure and support for that in the midst of recovering from a hurricane? A shortage of workers due in part to a lack of housing is a major challenge to answering those questions. 
But recovery means more than removing debris or rebuilding homes. It calls for planning and the resources to put plans into action. Lake Charles hosted the first of a series of forums called Louisiana Speaks, aimed at formulating near-, medium-, and long-term plans for rebuilding southern Louisiana. The Louisiana Recovery Authority, or LRA, which will have a hand in divvying up billions of dollars in federal disaster aid, sponsored the meetings. Spending these funds wisely will require careful balancing of diverse interests, according to LRA consultant Peter Calthorpe. Without consensus, of course, southern Louisiana's future probably becomes a little less robust in terms of approaching Washington, D.C. for the necessary funding that's going to be needed here in terms of having coordinated efforts within southern Louisiana between the parishes. One proposal generating heated discussion, relocating hundreds, if not thousands, of households out of flood-prone areas. It's called risk mitigation. Drew Sachs, also an LRA consultant, is a specialist in this area. Uh, the town of Cameron might, might be a possible possibility. Uh, that, that's a community that, again, has been wiped out twice in the last 50 years. Uh, and you know, they had a wall of, of water, of storm surge, in excess of 20 feet. Uh, rushed through that, that community and virtually nothing's left. It's, it's not an issue anymore in an event like this whether your house survived. It's an issue about whether your neighborhood and your community can survive the next event. It's not whether you repair the school uh, and make it safer. It's how do you bring back an entire school system in a way that's more sustainable. When you have that kind of suffering that occurs and that kind of damage that occurs, it may make sense to at least have that kind of discussion about, about whether it's really smart to remain in those locations. Despite uncertainties, the will to recover is evident throughout the region. In Vinton, City Council member Karen Douglas has no doubts about the future. Uh, Vinton's been down a lot, you know, and we're, we're coming up. We've got infrastructure that was coming in that was going great. We got a new city hall, we got a new police department. Things were really going good for Vinton. But this is not going to knock us down. This will not knock us down. We are strong people here, and we will survive, and we will build back up. We're going to make it. Six months after Rita's fury, life and death decisions, whether to stay or go, where to build, are still being debated. And no one in southwest Louisiana can escape the ever-present reminders of the terrible storm that changed so many lives. But what about the rest of the nation? We believe, from a national media perspective, this area of the state was pretty much forgotten. Calcasieu Parish Assistant Administrator Brian Beam doesn't think that's entirely a bad thing. In the big picture, that probably means we did things right, because typically the, the national media is going to stay here if there's problems. So we, in the long run, we take it as a compliment. But we're glad to see that people are now starting to realize how bad we did get hit here in southwest Louisiana, and we're doing something about it. The physical scars of Rita, the broken houses, flooded schools, destroyed businesses, will be covered over, carted off, or rebuilt. But this storm will likely never be forgotten by the people of southwest Louisiana. Welcome back. Our citizen participants join us from Lake Charles and surrounding communities, including Bell City, Creole, and Cameron. Their experiences with Hurricane Rita vary from people who have lost their family homes to others who have lost their entire communities. We also have two McNeese students who had their college careers disrupted by the storm. As we've just seen, response to Hurricane Rita in this part of the state continues to receive praise. So let's start there. Do you think local officials responded more effectively than those during Hurricane Katrina? And if so, why? In Cameron Parish, it was a way of life. We, after Hurricane Audrey, we evacuated constantly. We just we knew what we had to do when it got to be that time. We had a plan, a program, and everybody did it. You didn't wait to see that it was going to hit you. We evacuated a lot of times when it would hit New Orleans and other places. Animals and everything was gone. Ray, was this a planning thing from before, or was this great work by the, the good people in southwest Louisiana? I think it's probably a combination. Uh, I, in some ways, I, it, I, I, it almost sounds offensive to say it, but in a way I'm kind of glad that Katrina hit first because we did have that prep time. We saw what could happen if you didn't plan and you didn't respond effectively. So, um, so in, in a sense, I think it is in part response. Um, I, I would also say, though, that our leaders, in, in a sense, I kind of disagree with the other comment. I, I think our leaders did an exceptional job um, in, in some pre-planning and the way that they responded. 
they're to be commended, I believe. So it sounds like everybody did a good job and so we can forget the storm. Uh, no. no. <laughs> Sandy, what do you think? We were lucky to have in place before the hurricanes, both of them, a social service system <laughs> and agencies that were already in place through very strong networks that had been developed over many years. We had a unique community to begin with. When Katrina hit and we took on those evacuees, we were already geared up for that. So we switched our Katrina to our Rita and we were able to do a lot. We didn't have duplication of services because we'd already had that built into a very cooperative social service group. We still need a lot of help. It simply comes down to manpower and workers and money. Does the coverage of Katrina affect the help that you get? Brenda? Yes, I think that the coverage of Katrina uh, definitely affects the coverage that we get. Um, I think the more that uh, the media focuses on the coverage, the more funds that become available through private sources and through governmental aid. So yes, I definitely believe that it does. Is Lake Charles competing with New Orleans or is Southwest Louisiana com com competing with uh, other parts of the state for, for funds or for attention? in light of these two storms? I don't think we're competing. I agree with the gentleman. I think we all want what we deserve. We want respect from the insurance companies, the federal government. We want what we deserve. Can you get it? I think we can. Okay. I think we can. Because we're not going to stop until we get it. We're not going to stop. Brad, what's your outlook for southwest Louisiana after Hurricane Rita? Oh. I would hope that the community can move forward. Um, there's still a lot of rebuilding to be done. There's still a lot of people that, you know, like Cheryl said, that are looking to get their houses repaired, getting with the insurance companies. And, you know, if we stay focused, if, if people, you know, stick to their right mind and, and know that, that, you know, hopefully this will come to an end soon, that we'll be all right. What are the big problems? What are, the, what are you concerned about the most as we pass the six-month mark for Rita? Any concerns? You, you think we can get back to normal in the next week, month, year? Yeah. Well, we're going to be dealing with it for a couple of years, but, you know, my house was damaged. Let's deal with it. And I'm not, it doesn't bother me. You know, just go to work and take care of my stuff, take care of my business. I think if we do that, we focus on take care of taking care of our business every day, everything's going to be all right. Is it an individual thing? Is there something that we need to do um, as a group? Are there big issues for this region in the state that we have to worry about together, or should we work on our houses, and should we worry about our own self? I think we're going to have to pitch in together regardless to get mm -hmm. this thing back together. We have to come together as a nation, first of all, as a state, uh, as a state uh, first of all, as a nation, second of all, and get this thing handled, uh, not just to look to, uh, towards government for help all the time. So it needs to be some individual attention as well. Oh, we need to work on this. Definitely ourselves we need to now it, it seems like it's hard it sounds like it's hard to find people to repair your houses it sounds like it's hard to find people to fill in for the new jobs and the the new demands that we need is there anything that the government can do I think the government so far has been a hindrance for the housing I'm from Cameron Parish and right now we don't know what the FEMA regulations are we don't know what the insurance regulations are going to be so it's a blockade from our citizens getting back to Cameron Parish rebuilding is down the line, but right now it's what are the regulations? And we can't get a straight answer from the government, insurance industry, and whatnot. It looked like you had a couple of comments that you wanted to follow up with Willie's statement. Yeah, one, earlier you said something about things back to normal. I think in our communities, normal is being redefined. And it's going to be a real hard struggle, and it's not a sprint but a marathon. But Willie touched on something that's going to be a great challenge, it has to do with insurance especially in Cameron Parish or below Calcasieu Parish. Um, they're canceling insurances. They're going to reissue insurances. Um, you can't build or rebuild if you can't borrow money. You can't borrow money if you can't e get insurance. Insurance is going to be the big player now. And I'm not sure if uh, some of our leaders are aware of that or see the grand implications of not being able to rebuild because that will control the regrowth and the population and the businesses for anything south of I-10. And you bring up a good point. I mean, should we rebuild Cameron? And I don't mean to say that in a way that's going to hurt the good people of Cameron, but should insurance be able to help dictate that, or should our government do that? Rebuilding, I think, yes. But not that we need to rebuild it. Let us rebuild. We pay insurance premiums. They insured it. They need to stand up to what they insured for. Things are going to change. We realize that. 
But I don't think anybody's asking really the government to do it. I think when people came back in Cameron Parish, they didn't ask, you know, come do everything for us. The expectations for our government and FEMA, I think, were a little bit less. You know, don't come do it all for us. We need a little help. We do need help. But don't have to do it all. We can do it. Hey, should the help come in financial incentives from the government, or should the help be just to get out of the way? Should the government let you build wherever you'd like to build as long as you have the money to do it, or should the government say you can't build in Cameron Parish anymore? There are too many floods. No, I, I don't think that should even be a, a, a statement. You know, that's so many people's homes, so many people's livelihood, and you can't take that away from anyone. I mean, nobody's asking for government help. In fact, I know one of the big roadblocks for getting people back into Cameron was the government saying, no way, you can't go, you can't rebuild, you can't clean up. So I know that was a big issue, but I don't think the government should have a choice in that. Beverly. What do you think? I thought I saw well, you. Well, I have been very concerned, and, and Randy brought it up earlier about housing. It seems to me that we really have a very low stock of affordable housing, and at this time, very little of anything. Um, I have a unique situation because my entire family is from New Orleans, and they all came here, and of course, they'd stay with me because there was no housing, and we've got them temporarily placed now. But they like the community of Lake Charles, but they're just as an affordable. That's the real key, affordable housing. For many people who are going to be displaced, because I was born and raised in New Orleans, and I have various ideas and thoughts about New Orleans, and it doesn't always agree with the politicians or even some of my dearest friends or family. But they lost everything, and the area in which they actually lived was the um, upper uh, ninth ward and some in the lower ninth ward. And I mean, we could have a hard rain in New Orleans and that flood. So I really believe that, I don't believe in a lot of government intervention, but I think it makes sense to think hard before you put you know, hundreds of thousands of people in harm's way because this is where they always were. I mean. Watching what happened in Katrina was about the most devastating thing I think that America has experienced in this country. And I, I, I'm fortunate, I only have one member of my family who is, has not been accounted for. But um, it's, it's just a terrible uh, situation with hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people displaced and have really no way to go. They, it's hard to imagine someone born and raised in Louisiana living in Utah. Even I wouldn't want to live in Utah because of the cold. But it's, it's a number of, of issues, serious heart-wrenching issues. Are, are, are trailers the answer? Edward, do you think you know, a trailer for a year or two years would help get this community back where it needs to go? Or do we need bigger or, or better plans for housing? I think, first of all, that it is a beginning. Um, but uh, the real issue here in southwest Louisiana is, as someone mentioned earlier, we did not get the media coverage that I think we deserve down here in southwest Louisiana. You know, we, I heard about New Orleans even this afternoon before, you know, coming here today. But I don't think I ever heard anything about Cameron, but maybe one time on national network. I think that we really did not get the coverage that was needed to demonstrate to the nation that we had a whole community, as was indicated on our intro this afternoon, that this whole community was wiped out. The only thing standing in Cameron shortly after the storm, when I arrived Tuesday after Rita, was the city courthouse. That's all that was in Cameron. And that's where the emergency preparedness was located. And I really believe because of the emergency preparedness office and pre-planning and uh, I would say the uh, <coughs> trial runs uh, that we did here on the leadership of our state and city governments, um, you know, did well for, for us to go through that in order for us to succeed in the evacuation process and the whole recovery process as we're still in right now. I, I think I understand what you're saying, and Joanne, help me. Do you think that because 
Southwest Louisiana didn't get a lot of coverage. Do you think that's affecting the way state and the state and federal government now reacts to the issues in Southwest Louisiana? I don't think so. Okay. There's no way that they could get media coverage down there, you know, during that time, because that's why we were kept out, because it wasn't safe for one thing, but uh, the, I don't think it affected us, you know, and really not having the media coverage, but we did not get it, really. Looking forward, do you think that the media coverage is going to affect what happens to Southwest Louisiana in the future, or is it going to come from somewhere else? Wayne? I think it will affect, the media coverage will affect how we're seen, the question about rebuilding. I think part of what we're asking in this part of the country is let's treat everybody fairly. You know, why have different standards in Cameron Parish or Calcasieu Parish versus New Orleans? If, if you look at Miami, what's going to happen when a Category 4 rolls in there? Will there be a question about rebuilding there? Probably not. But why here? Cameron Parish only has 6,500 voters. There's no political stroke there. There's nobody that's really standing up for the small parishes that surround Calcasieu and Orleans Parish. And it's tough, though. I mean, you know, I understand that you said that there's not the political stroke, but should the state have to pay to rebuild Cameron over and over again? Rosa, what do you think? I don't believe the state um, have to pay to rebuild uh, Cameron. Uh, as um, they said earlier, it's a joint thing, and it, it, I believe that everybody should get together and do what um, is able to do to rebuild the area. Evan, if insurance companies say that we're not going back to Cameron Parish, and if the state says we're not going back to Cameron Parish, build at your own risk, would you go back? Um, if that's where my life was, um, I probably would, because I've grown up there, and that's where I started my life. That's where all my memories are. So if that's the area that's, that I hold dear to my heart, I probably would rebuild. But um, like everyone was saying, we, it, we didn't get enough media coverage. Um, being a mass communications major, there's this thing that um, the media does called sets the world's agenda. And the media doesn't realize how powerful that, that message is. Um, when Hurricane Katrina occurred, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing something about Hurricane Katrina. And with the media broadcasting like every 30 minutes, finally uh, citizens got tired of hearing about it. So it's kind of like it's gone. And it's kind of like the Iraq war. Uh, every, when we first started the Iraq war, everything just Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. And now there's still people dying, but it's not getting a lot of coverage because uh, citizens aren't that interested in it. And I think that's what occurred with Hurricane Rita. So it sounds like you're saying that you that the 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 price of success for planning well and, and handling things well is that no one pays attention to what's going on here now, Brad. Is that the case? I mean, I think everybody's paying attention to what's going on. You know, it's just for this area. You know, when Lake Charles or when Southwest Louisiana got hit by the hurricane, it just you know it, you know it's almost embedded in everybody's mind that Katrina had done the damage. Uh, everybody visualized what went on in New Orleans and. You know, it wasn't as, as much of an impact when it hit Lake Charles or the Cameron area. So, you know, it, you know, it's still trying to, you know, go forward with all with all that, that happened. Okay. Lena, what's the direction forward? Where do we go? Well, I tell you, I live in the Sweet Lake area, and we are very populated now. And you know, not that it's caused any problems, and we welcome everybody from down below Cameron into our area, but. We can foresee some problems coming up, like water, for instance. Our water uh, system is not geared for all the expert people. So they're thinking now we're going to have to have, uh, uh, you know, regulations on that this summer. And then, you know, when you talk about water, I start to think about farms. And we haven't talked a lot about farming and, and, and agriculture in southwest Louisiana. Can that be the same after Rita? Farmers are having a hard time. A lot of them are not going to be able to farm. Phyllis, what do you think? Well, I don't know much about farming, but I can tell you that, you know, the towns of Cameron, Creole, Johnson Bayou, those, these aren't little sleepy fishing villages where people can go and fish on the jetties. These are vital to Louisiana, to the nation. You know, it, it's, it's not just a place where people go on weekends. Uh, there's a lot of resources in Cameron, uh, from the seafood industries to the oil industries that, like I said, are vital to uh, Louisiana. And the nation. And you talk about two industries that 
when I think of Southwest Louisiana, I think about oil and I think about seafood, it doesn't, we don't get a lot of coverage about that. Ray, is there anything else that we can do in Southwest Louisiana to make sure the, the nation knows what's, what's going on there? I'm not entirely sure that it's, that it's strictly a, um, an issue of enough media coverage. To me, one of the things, uh, someone touched on it earlier, and that is the, the bureaucracy that prevents the money that is there. I mean, uh, you know, uh, McNeese State University uh, had, a, had a chance at several million dollars and um, some of this money came from private sources, but the, but the bureaucracy won't allow that money to be spent. So yeah, uh, when, when you look at rebuilding, um, you, you can't ignore that there are monies out there available, but as long as the bureaucracy is in place, um, you know, all the media coverage in the world is not going to, uh, is not going to free it up unless you can move the politicians to free it up. Jan, if you were trying to move a politician, what, what <laughs> thing do you want them to know? What thing do you want your elected officials to know about the issues going on in southwest Louisiana? I want them to know how we feel, what we need, and to keep the lines of communication open, because if they're not open, we're not going to go forward. What do you need? How do you feel? How do I feel? Uh, like I said, we need to keep those lines open. You know, if we need someone needs help in their home, then we need to know so we can get the people over there. You know, we have some groups set up that are helping people right now. And we've done a, I think we've done a very good job, especially down in the Sweet Lake, Grand Lake area, as far as keeping, getting the people to gather to say, okay, you have this resource we can use. You have this one. And it kind of brings me to an interesting point. We, it sounds like you were happy with the way uh, local officials reacted after Rita. Six months later, what's the great, Greg? What's so great? What, what, well, I think our, our, our officials did react well. They were here before the storm even ended, what cleaning, about today? Up the, cleaning up the area. What about today? Right. I think our local officials are doing really well. I think it's the federal government that needs to get out of the way or <laughs> do, some, do something, you know. Either get out of the way or, or help out. I understand. Belinda, I saw you not as well. The federal government is the, it gets the lower mark than the local officials, at least now. I think a big thing on my part, um, the FEMA office needs to, they need a lot more inside communication with one another. I am in a, tra a travel trailer. Thankful to my husband's job, he worked at Northwood Grumman and they managed to get us a trailer. FEMA kept telling us we would have a mobile home on our property. And I have three boys who are very tall and it's very, it sleeps five very well, but it's very, uncomfortable when they get backpacks out and start doing homework and it's a frustrating thing because you know you call FEMA and it's like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is talking about and I think that area really needs um, some work in you know um, again it's been six months and it it's beginning to get it's not just stressful it's emotional you know the other day my eight-year-old says mom I remember when we used to live in our house you know and, and that begins to get emotional and you're trying to work and you're trying to get them through school and keep the life functional and it's, it's we need more assistance on a hurry up basis it's one of these hurry up and wait things and Lacey Belinda talked about emotions are there any other emotional issues that you wish you could talk to elected officials about I personally know I wasn't my home was not damaged by the storm of course my niece was damaged, and yes, I was inconvenienced, and yes, there were times where I felt frustrated, but everybody's frustrated. I think it's something that we're all dealing with. So you take it as it goes, and eventually you adapt to the changes. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further discuss Hurricane Rita, the Forgotten Storm. We're discussing Hurricane Rita, the Forgotten Storm, tonight on Louisiana Public Square. Joining us now is our panel of experts, the Honorable Hadley Ward Fontenot, Judge of the 38th Judicial District and longtime Cameron Parish resident, Rodney Gehan, Lake Charles City Councilman who served as interim mayor for the city in 2000, Thomas Henning, a member of the Louisiana Recovery Authority and an attorney who is a lifelong Calcasieu Parish resident, and State Senator Willie Mount who is serving her second term and chairs the Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Committee. Senator Mount also served for six years as mayor of Lake Charles. Let's go to our participants for their questions. 
Edward, I think you wanted to start us off this afternoon. I am a, uh, an employee of the Diocese of Lake Charles, Secretary for Pastor Services. And since Hurricane Rita, we have been networking with and connected and affiliated with Catholic Charities USA, of which you know, we've received a little over $2 million to help with assisting the people in Calcasieu and Cameron Parishes and in our areas who were affected by Hurricane Rita. And as of late, we have been trying to help with the restoration uh, process in Lower Cameron Parish in Hagbury, Cameron, Grand Chenier, Little Chenier, Johnson Bayou, as well as in Holly Beach. <clears throat> I'd like to know when are we going to be able to receive some relief from somewhere, be it private sector or government, to assist the people. So our, our, our question is what is, you know, the insurance doing, what is the FEMA doing, what is SBA doing? You know, what, what are they doing? Well, <clears throat> what, what I found out is that the, it is, to me, there's a FEMA issue on the rebuilding. It's, the people down in Cameron Parish can't rebuild until uh, FEMA finally uh, publishes all their regulations of where, how and, and, and what height you're supposed to build. Until that's done, you're not going to be able to uh, deal with the insurance uh, future. Now, I'm not talking about the people who have past claims. That Judge Fontenot might be able to speak to that one a little bit better, but the people with past claims, uh, that's a whole different issue. But whether or not you'll be able to get future insurance is going to be uh, an issue up to the insurance companies, I guess. And then I think there's a, a plan program that uh, for the uninsured right now that the state of Louisiana has, and I'm not sure what the viability of that plan going forward is. Then you got banks. I mean, can, are they going to loan you any money without insurance? And, and, and until those uh, regulations are, are, are established, we're we're spinning our wheels, and it's not a good situation. It's, it's I mean, it's to, the, to the people, they just want to know what what can I do? And and, exactly. and 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 we're just we're pushing them. I understand they keep working on them, but that's as far as I know right now. And, and Senator, is there anything that the state can do to try and get Edward and, and people in the parishes some relief? Well, certainly, uh, Tom is uh, one of our representatives, as you know, from this area with the LRA, or Louisiana Recovery Authority, and working hand-in-hand -hand with the state and all the <laughs> variety of agencies. Uh, we have continued to focus on what Tom has, has mentioned, which is the whole disconnect with the federal government, or with FEMA in this case, where whatever they ask us to do, these are the requirements, this is the process you must take, whether that's through the state government itself or through the LRA, we do what we are required to do procedurally. But we still are waiting, you know, as I talk to constituents, individual issues that come up, phone calls that I get, and we take that one incident and use that as an example. Say, this is what happened to Ms. Jones. What else can we do to, you know, accelerate the process as an example? I had a, a lady who called a friend who was a friend of mine because she didn't want to call me or was afraid to call me or whatever. And she shared with me the dilemma, which was she applied uh, soon after or right when you could apply for a trailer. And she's a widow, you know, fixed income, you know, very limited resources. And, you know, she didn't call until she was just so frustrated, as you adequately have described, for many people. And again, we picked up the phone, we called all the different agencies, the sources we can find, please help this lady. I mean, she's waited, at that point, it was almost five months, so not long ago, before she actually received the trailer. I mean, she had no place. She was living with, you know, holes in her roof and, and wind and so forth. So we share your frustration, yes, and we are doing all the things that we can do through local government, state government, with nonprofits. And, and I heard one of you all say earlier the significance that Southwest Louisiana has played and I think has made such a difference for our folks who need help is that you are out front, that we are all working together extremely well compared to the rest of those that we've talked about this evening. We have the United Way being a real catalyst for us. Um, I, for one, you know, want to praise our, our state employees, where each of us, and I know you've seen it too, our Department of Social Services workers were working day, they work late at night, they work seven days a week, whatever it took to process 
those initial folks who came to us. First of all, with Katrina, when we had 20,000 people, and then when Rita hit three weeks later, you know, they, they, they were just ongoing, and they never quit, and they were there helping people. So we want to continue to do that. Now, Belinda, I know that you had some issues with the trailers earlier. Are there any questions that you have about what you can do in the future? Uh, I don't know, but I know every day when I drive on Chenault to go stay at that FEMA trailer, there's a ton of mobile homes sitting there waiting for somebody to have them. A ton of them. They're bringing them in every day when we either leaving or going. There's FEMA trailers and there's mobile homes, and they're just sitting out there with somebody's name on them, but they're not on somebody's property. And there are many people in Cameron who need them. Um, the passion is still there. You know, what our government officials need to know about is the, the jobs were lost. You know, uh, the working man, the working lady, their jobs were lost, uh, completely washed away. The fishing industry, some of these oil servicing industries, uh, all of these people need help as well. They, they don't really want a hand out. They really want a, a helping hand to get back in business. Well, do you need to call your state senator to get the hand up? Or what, is, is there anything else we can do? Councilman. Well, just a week ago, um, the president of the council, Mike Huber, Vice President um, David Perry, as well as myself, Paul Rainwater, the uh, city uh, assistant to the mayor, along with our city attorney, Billy Lofton, we traveled to Washington, D.C. And first, we met with our Louisiana delegation to uh, place emphasis on our needs. They were well aware of what our needs are. And I must say that they are fighting as hard as they can fight for the people in South Louisiana. However, we had an opportunity to bring a, a plan, a proposal, that they said that we were lacking in in the very beginning before we can get any monies. And we brought three different plans. We even brought a video uh, that was um, made by KPLC of the devastation that we experienced here in South Louisiana. So they have all of the documentation but we want to impact their minds that do not forget about Rita. There was another hurricane name called Rita besides Katrina. And I think we, we, did, we made that connection and we are supposed to now, and we are supposed to get somewhere in the neighborhood of $4.2 billion uh, coming to our state. But before that can happen, uh, there are some, as you well, no, red tape need to be taken care of. <clears throat> but we did visit the, the senator from uh, Pennsylvania. And I must say, uh, Senator Ma uh, Mary Landra, she was in Lake, uh, Lake Charles as well as Cameron today with that senator. She promised that she would bring him to our area whereby he could see firsthand the devastation <coughs> that the people of this area experienced. And he promised over uh, national TV that he is gonna go back and enlighten other congressmen as to what we really experienced, because they don't really know. And the reason being is because we did such a great job of organizing ourselves to evacuate and, and save lives. And they don't understand that we experienced devastation too. So we're looking forward to some funding coming our way. And Judge, you know, when we talk about experiencing devastation, you experienced it firsthand. The courthouse sounds like it's one of the few buildings remaining in Cameron Parish. Are there any concerns that you have going forward? Well, the courthouse was the only functional building uh, after Rita. And uh, we were displaced from the courthouse first by the lack of any power or water or sewage. Uh, when that was reestablished, it became the headquarters for the Corps of Engineers, the National Guard, and FEMA, and so we were still displaced. In fact, as of today, I, we still hold court in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, thanks to the good graces of the 14th Judicial District Court and their ju Judicial Center. But we plan to be back uh, on April 3rd. We'll actually start the move next week because you can't, uh, you can't move it all in, in just one day. Uh, as a resident of Cameron, uh, I and the Judicial District, uh, we feel like we are victims too. Uh, we are trying to seek help for the district and things associated with ju the Judicial Service of the Parish both through the police jury, which is our spokesman for FEMA locally, and through the Supreme Court, which is our spokesman to FEMA on a state basis. And uh, I feel all the frustration that Mr. Levine expressed. Uh, it seems like each day there's a different plan, and you, it depends on who you spoke to last. 
and uh, the, the help is not forthcoming, nor is it clear exactly what you must do to get it. But uh, at the same time, I see progress. I see uh, that FEMA has accomplished a whole lot, and uh, so we're thankful for that. Willie, earlier you were talking a little bit about Cameron Parish as, as well, and, and we talked about some of the issues related to, I guess, whether it was whether public money should come in or whether private money should come in. Do you have any issues or questions about that? I thought you were, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, maybe, I'm sorry, Wayne. Well, I, I guess part of it is there's a question about how much the government should do, but part of the other issue is how much hindrance it sometimes can be as far as the rebuilding processes, putting businesses, and we are running into some difficulties where some of the political process, we're six months out, and unfortunately, some of that goodwill is going away and some of the political processes are going back to some self-interest, there's a perception anyway. And, but there are hindrances as far as what's rebuilding, what are the codes, it takes a while, but it's been a while. You would think that at this point in time, the whole process would be getting easier and people would be getting uh, more attuned to it, but I find that it's getting harder because now we're getting to the hard part of rebuilding from nothing. It's not repairs, but it's rebuilding. And it's gonna take money, both state and private, and let's don't get in the way. And McNeese lost some money because somebody said they couldn't take some private money and some different kind of things like that. I don't know all the story, but there are some hindrances and we need to figure out how to cut those strings. Experts, well, are there anything we can do? Yes, and I think Wayne makes some really good points. Uh, I think there are a couple of things that we need to remember, and that is that it has been six months, which seems like a long time, but it really isn't. In the sense of what we've discussed earlier about the disconnect with FEMA or the federal dollars, that's really a large part of what's holding us back because, as you know, we've had two special sessions. We had one in November, uh, soon after uh, we could, from the two, recovering from the two hurricanes, and then a second one just last month in February with our regular coming up. Uh, on the 27th of March. But the point being, we um, accelerated anything we could do to help individuals, to help businesses, to help uh, our public schools, as an example, McNeese, Sorella, any of those types of things. We were able to pass legislation in order to remedy any of those hindrances that would, would be there. One of the examples that was used earlier about uh, the private sector, a nonprofit willing to donate money to McNeese. And in fact, they did have difficulty initially because they wanted to utilize the money for obviously to, to improve a certain part of the infrastructure at McNeese. And for the viewing audience, McNeese lost, what, 65, 75 percent of their buildings. Same thing with Sewella. But the amazing thing about Sewella and McNeese is they didn't wait around. They worked hard, they worked with the state agencies, and they were back up and running, offering students the opportunity to continue their education. And in fact, we had McNeese graduation with around 700 uh, individuals. So that speaks volumes about the can-do attitude of folks down here, of folks at McNeese and Sewella and in Cameron and everywhere else. So that is an issue that we continue to push on. Again, we have fine people like Tom Hume who's <coughs> willingly agreed to serve on the LRA. And again, they're kind of the catalyst or the conduit to, to connect all the different uh, uh, dealings or agencies that we have with the federal government. And again, the LRA is made up of, of folks from all walks of life. And I think that's a real strength that we have folks who are from all walks of life with different expertise to collectively represent each and every one of us in this room and all through South Louisiana. So that is something that, that we are trying to, as well in the regular session, continue to shore up any of those uh, idiosyncrasies like you're saying, you know, don't, don't get in our way, just let us get the job done. And we're certainly attempting to do that. Many of you may be aware of the, uh, GOZON, what we call the GOZONE Act, but it's a federal legislation that Congress passed Another thing that we passed in this past session, meaning we offered the framework or, or cured it by having the framework so that we could in fact assist, again, local government, state government, any public entity like um, you know, the gravity drainage, any kind of uh, public entity that would need assistance. It also helps small businesses. And so there are different parts 
of um, the investment component, which will accelerate the reinvestment uh, into the southern part of the state. And again, back to housing, that's one of those pieces that plays an important role. Tom may want to add to that. Let me just, I, I think one of the things you commented on is it's, it's been six months. And, and a lot of people say that's too long. But we, we got to remember the devastation is tremendous. I mean, wiped out entire towns. You know, I mean, I call Cameron the entire town, Holly Beach entire town. I mean, just completely after years and years of, you know, 50 years of building up those communities, it's, it, it, I, I know it's hard to understand, and I'm not there. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't lose my home. And, and I, so I can't, I mean, I can sympathize, but I can't understand exactly. But to understand to rebuild that town in six months is tough. Now, I don't think there should be anything holding us up, and I, I think there's something out there holding us up. And it's some federal bureaucracy, but the problem also is those federal bureaucracies are spending billions and billions of dollars in this state, which we never would have seen before. And, and we're getting ready to get more of the spend. And, 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 you know, not to sugarcoat much of this, our state didn't have a good reputation up in Washington. You know, I mean, you, we read that right after the storm. You know, are we going to send all that money down to a state that basically has a lot of corruption and graft? Well, I think, you know, hopefully the LRA's uh, body that we put together is going up to Washington and showing them, and we go, we meet with Don Powell and show them numbers and figures and, and try to show them how we're going to protect the, the taxpayer dollars out of Michigan and New York and Vermont. And that's what's important because, you know, we, we, we need those dollars to help us get that helping hand. We don't want a handout. I agree with you. We shouldn't. You know, we, we need to build it up ourselves. But there's a lot of things that we need that, that, that help us up. And if we're going to spend that kind of dollars for these people, we've got to make sure that they can trust us with it. And so because there, there may be more to come. I mean, that's what the federal government says. If we spend what's allocated to us wisely today, there may be more coming. And I can tell you, what, what's allocated today is only allocated. We don't have it. And Willie and I talked about this. But there's, there's the 4.2 that uh, uh, Councilman Guion spoke about isn't in the bank yet. In fact, there's a lot of states trying to take that money. And, and if that, they get that money, then our housing plan is now back on a different shelf. And you talk about how much housing. I mean, there's the housing plan, if we get the $4.2 billion, we're looking at uh, helping people rebuild uh, up to $150,000 a home to, to, to help them. And there's going to be need to build in Cameron because, I, I hate to say this, the federal government's going to make us build up high. They're going to make those people build up high. And, and, and if you don't build up high, then you're not going to be able to get electricity, you're not going to be able to get insurance, you're not going to be able to get loans. But no, will the people get that money? I mean, you know, it sounds like one statistic said that for every dollar that's spent in Louisiana, only 3% goes to the good people that need it. Can we trust the government? I know there's an issue about the government trusting us. Can we trust the government with sending us money down here? Well, when you speak of hindrances, uh, there is <clears throat> an institutional problem in, the, in some of the government officials who feel like perhaps they should not assist the people who live along the coast, that they should discourage uh, rebuilding. Uh, th that is the, um, that's the governmental problem. Then there's the private problem about the fact that the insurance companies have uh, taken a lick from this, uh, these two uh, storms, and uh, they're going to take steps to minimize their losses, uh, and that's going to affect adversely rebuilding along the coast. What we need to do is impress upon them just how important the coastal area is, both to the oil and gas industry, to the seafood industry, and it's just not a matter of the, the, the population. It's just not a matter of counting heads. Uh, it all begins, well, it doesn't all begin on the coast, but a lot of it begins on that coast and comes up to our rivers. And uh, we need to impress upon them that you just can't abandon the coastal communities. Well, I, I want to impact what the judge said as well, because that, that was a part of the message that we brought to Washington, D.C. 30% of the gas and oil that this nation used come from Louisiana, the coast. 40% of the fishing industry, seafood, comes from Louisiana. And my question to them, we contribute to this nation too. Why is it so hard for us to get our fair share 
when we stand in the need of, of finances and, 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 and help with our people who have been devastated, homes lost, uh, livestock lost, and we have to fight and beg for federal dollars when we contribute so much ourselves. So I, I commend you for what you said as well, Jerry. Beverly, earlier you talked about housing. And really for everybody, what's the biggest need that you think Southwest Louisiana needs to take care of right now? I mean, that's the real key. I mean, there's a lot of building going on. We've been here se seven years almost. And I mean, the average home that's being built is well over $200,000, well over. And the average person coming in, first insurance companies are not paying their fair share. And I, and I guess that leads to two questions I had, which you have answered, because my question was gonna be, where is all this money that the media is reporting that has already been sent to the state? And I understand we don't have it. The check's in the mail. And then we also, um, the other question would be, uh, if we have already on the books plans for affordable housing as a permanent solution, and I realize that the trailers are a short gap measure, but I, I'm really very concerned that in three months, we could start having another problem with all of these people who are living in trailers, mm -hmm. and those trailers are not safe in, in those kinds of winds and the possibility of water. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I was blessed. I had no damage, lost 10 trees out of 12, but the home was, was uh, stood, and we had that. We didn't have that problem. But um, just having to house the, the uh, evacuees that came in, they had to keep moving and moving and moving because Lake Charles had very little housing stock in the beginning. So one question, uh, Congressman, I'm sorry, Councilman Deanne, I've already elevated you because <laughs> I expect you to be there one day. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the other part is, you know, does Lake Charles currently have, and that, and that should include the other communities as well, on, on, on paper, a plan to build affordable housing? Is that in the mix? In, so that when the money comes, you're ready to move on it? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, okay. The mayor is very interested in such yes. uh, a project, and we know that once the money come in, so much is going to be allocated toward affordable housing, but we are dependent on the private sector as well to build as fast as they can. And I think that the greatest impact that could possibly be made if some sort of way or another that the government could get with the apartment complexes, the people that own apartments, whereby we could repair those apartments and service more people than just in one house at a time. And I think if we ponder on that concept, then we would eventually overcome the housing problem. But yes, we do have some plans in place from the city's point of view to address housing and affordable at that. I would and just like to make one comment, and that is, I, I really think I would like to give kudos to the city. I, I mean, I, I was very impressed with the way our local officials handle the emergency situation, the evacuation, but particularly the cleanup. I mean, uh, it's amazing. When we came back in and saw the devastation of the trees and all the debris that was lying all over the city, it's just a pleasure to know that that stuff is almost out of here. And that's a lot to say about uh, the city officials. So I really want to commend them on that. You know, We do have problems, but they did a fantastic job. Let me comment on the housing uh, because in the two organizations that I'm dealing with, which is the Louisiana Recovery Authority and in the city, uh, Council McGeehan and, and, and Mayor Roach, both of them see housing as, and, and I think the whole community, even down in Cameron Parish, I've been working with some of the uh, uh, administration down there, that's the, uh, that's the most important thing there is, and, and the local people working on it. The LRA, we, uh, as soon as we figured out that there was money coming in, and there was a, uh, we put together a plan and there's a, a, a task force. I'm not a member of that task force. Uh, the, the chairman is from St. Bernard, which I think somebody mentioned about the other rural parishes. That's a rural parish. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and, and they put together a plan. They worked very hard at it. And this is that plan that you may have read about. In fact, we announced it when we had the meeting here in Lake Charles, and uh, we went into more detail with it later on. And basically, it's going to be a, a, a in the housing uh, program to help the individual. It's not going to be go to a, a business guy. It's going to go to the people to help them either rebuild their house or buy their house for a maximum up to $150,000, and you can get construction. On the need for speed, we had uh, we announced the, the the concept at the meeting in Lake Charles two meetings ago. The last meeting we had was just two weeks ago in uh, Baton Rouge. The task force reported the details of it. How is it going to work? How are you going to have deductions on your insurance and FEMA? You know how you were going to uh, get the valuation of your house. If your house was only worth seventy five, you're not going to get one hundred fifty. You will get seventy five. And what we did there. Uh, we voted to amend our, um, our agenda to get that out that day because it was supposed to wait another month, you know, which, again, you know, you're talking about speed. We, we voted to get it because we needed to get it to the legislature and let them say uh, have a say-so and say yes to it so we, then we can get it up to the federal government. Now, again, that does include the $4.2 billion we don't have yet. And so I just want to say that that's a – you know, we're trying. You know, we're, tr we're trying to work. We try. When there's instances where at least the local people can, can work, I think that, that we do move forward. And I know uh, the city's working hard, and I'm trying to help them in, in moving forward with a, a affordable housing for the area. And, Council, I think you're going to have to have the, the last word. We've, we've run out of time today, um, but we want to thank our panelists, Judge Fontenot, uh, uh, Councilman uh, Gian, Mr. Henning, and Senator Mao for joining us tonight. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. We ran out of time. I wanted to talk more. I know. We always want to. But certainly the problems exist, and we'll have to come back again. But I am so impressed with the sort of can-do attitude of southwest Louisiana. Absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they dug in, and it sounds like they just want to get to work and, and are trying to make sure they can get to work without too much interference. We certainly have the questions established. I'm not sure we can overcome all the bureaucracy that is in place, but that's going to be for another edition, perhaps, of Public Square. And we thank you again for being with us this evening in the city of Lake Charles and the Central School Arts and Humanities Center for hosting us. And we invite all of you at home to take our full online survey about Hurricane Rita, the Forgotten Storm, by going to lpb.org. Join us next month on Louisiana Public Square when we explore the state of our health and health care delivery system on RX4 Louisiana. Well, for all of us at LPB, thanks for watching and good night. A home video of this program is available. For more information, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. We power hope. We power dreams. We power life. But there's one power we all have. The power to make a difference. The power to vote. Energy. The power of people.